Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to Tuesday Afternoon Networking. Isn't it amazing that our state has more national parks than any other state? Nature's beauty is so inspiring. I hope one day to visit all of them. Like many public assets, all our national and state parks are created by and funded by our government. And just as California has many laws to protect our national parks, they also have laws in real estate to protect the renters and tenants. Welcome to session five of our Investors Medley series. My name is Coco Tan. As a realtor with Keller Williams Realty in the San Francisco Bay Area, one of my goals is to keep all of my followers informed about recent changes to laws that will affect them. The COVID-19 pandemic constantly causes laws to be rewritten amended and extended. Today's talk is titled Prone to Protection and is about rent collection, eviction laws, and tenant-landlord relations during COVID-19. Whether you are a landlord or a tenant, it's good to know what your options are and how to protect yourself. This seminar will be particularly relevant to those of you who own a rental property, especially if you have a long-term rental. You may already know that there is currently a moratorium on evictions. As long as a tenant pays 25% of the rent, they cannot be evicted, at least through the end of June 2021. That is one piece of evidence that California's laws are the nation's strongest in terms of renter protection. But that's not the entire story, because the law also has provisions for landlords. Senate Bill 91, also known as SB 91, is a new law that uses billions of dollars of federal funding to make up for loss of income if your tenant is unable to pay rent. If you have questions or want more information about rent collection, evictions, and landlord-tenant relations, then you have come to the right place at the right time. I have invited a real estate attorney to shed light on all these issues the good thing about having an attorney is because they are always up to date with the law. Today, our expert guest is David Bonacorsi. He is a partner with the law firm of Bernard Buckley and Bonacorsi LLP and has practiced law in Fremont and Newark since 1987. He served 10 years on Fremont Plan uh, Planning Commission and was twice elected Planning Commission Chair. He's also the legal advisor for the Chinese American Real Estate Association. He regularly educates audiences about this topic in particular. Hi, David. How are you today? Good evening, Coco. Wonderful. Hi. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. And that entree, yes. Thank you. We have a lot of investors in the audience who really want to hear what you have to say today. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Let's get started. So would you like us to play the slides? Absolutely. Let's just okay. jump right into the slides. Uh, we're coming up on one year of our moratorium that was enacted in March of last year. So as I see our slides, hopefully this will be driven as you can uh, listen in and, and read along as I'm presenting it. So as I'm going through uh, to your wonderful team, I'm going to ask for the next slide and that's your signal to go to the next slide, please. So can we go to the next slide? There we go. And then we'll continue on. This has been a one year journey almost. And what happened beginning with the pandemic and the de declaration of a state of emergency by the governor last year, he began authorizing local control both in the area of commercial uh, rentals and residential rentals. I'll, I'll touch slightly, a little bit lightly on the commercial, but focus mainly on SB 91 today on the rental uh, ends. But last year we had the counties and cities all getting into the act and creating different rules, depending upon where you were in California, where you own property. And in April of last year, even our state Supreme Court judge and the Judicial Commission got involved and had an entire six month period of time where there was no evictions whatsoever with very limited exceptions. That ended in September 1st of last year. And what happened then, let's go to the next slide, is a precursor or is, is going on today with SB 91. So it's important to look at what happened as of September 1st. Next slide, please. 
Uh, as I said, March 4th of last year, it's already uh, this week, to, you know, it's or gonna be a year from the state of emergency. And then uh, Governor Newsom extended various executive orders authorizing local control. And the one that we're gonna look at a little bit at the end is that there is authority for local control for commercial that will expire unless the governor extends it on the end of March of 2021. Next slide, please. So uh, AB 3088 came in just as the state was backing off our Judicial Commission backed off on moratorium. It was the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act of 2020. So it's called CITRA. And then I was focusing because I practice in Alameda County, I've spoken before Alameda County uh, investors and uh, property managers. Uh, Alameda County, I'll go into it, still is the law in this area. But AB 3088 or CITRA passed on September 1st. Um, Citra is and was the law unless the county enacted or renewed its ordinance before August 19th of 2020. Alameda County ordinances applies because it was enacted before August, of, uh, uh, August 19th, but in Santa Clara County, although they had attempted to renew their ordinance, it doesn't apply. So AB 3088 took over and now SB 91 is the rule. So if you've got property in San Mateo County or Santa Clara County, look to SB 90, 91. In Alameda County, and I don't know how many investors are here in Alameda County or have got property in Alameda County, rent is due 12 months from the date due, but Citra ends deferral on March 1st, 2021. So if you had a tenant that didn't pay rent in March of last year, they could defer paying rent until March of this year, and be, but beginning in April, they're going to have to start paying rent. The eviction ban for all residential tenants in Alameda County extends 60 days after the county health emergency expires. And because it's past 1231, 2020, it's still in effect in Alameda County. Next slide, please. Let's focus on the Citra because again, Citra continues on with SB 91. Citra does not apply to commercial tenants, nor does SB 91. It's only regarding residential tenants. There are really now, um, two periods of time that you got to focus in. The first was March 1st to August 31st, 2020. A tenant who provided a declaration or high income tenant meeting certain requirements and verification cannot be evicted for rent non-payment that became due. During that entire period, all the rent uh, that was due if they could not afford it due to COVID um, is not a basis ever for a, any three day or 15 day notice to to pay rent. It's not forgiven, but it's not a basis for trying to recover possession of the uh, unit. A high income resident, which is a term that still applies, is defined as a household income, which is 130% of AMI. Uh, uh, oops, go back, please. I'm not done yet. Uh, uh, area median income, but such a high income resident must produce proof of income, such as a tax return or a W-2 or pay stub. So if you've got a high income tenant, they may be able to qualify for some of the protections of Citra and now SB 91. If they, you know, for example, you had two engineers and suddenly for whatever reason, they're not working as telecommuting and their company, their startup shut down and they're really out of work, but they may have been high income, but they too can get COVID protection. There was an informational notice that was due September 30th that indicated what was gonna happen for the past rent and then also an informational notice that was gonna happen for the rent going from September 1st. And as Coco so eloquently described at the very beginning, it really set into motion what still exists today under SB 91, which is a tenant that can provide a declaration, um, must uh, not be required to pay more than 25% of the rent due. And that's rent due cumulatively. That doesn't mean rent per month, it meant, means rent per the end of the period. And so when Citra was in existence, somebody could pay rent on January 30th to cover all of the rent for September, October, November, December, and January, as long as it was 25% of the five months of rent that was due, and they'd still not be subject to eviction on February 1st before SB 91 came into effect. Next slide, please. This, uh, this is more of the highlights of Citra. It's form driven as the statute mandates specific uh, language. There was also the Federal CARES Act, which 
if you have a if you have an investment property in which is backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, um, then you're subject to federal law and you not only have to give them what's called a 15 day notice to pay rent if they haven't paid rent, but if they don't pay rent, uh, it's uh, 30 days to vacate. Otherwise, if it's not backed by a federally backed mortgage, it's 15 days to pay rent, 15 days to cure, or 15 days to quit uh, the property, that's up to them. Huge change because all of us that have done um, unlawful detainers for all these years are familiar with the three-day notice to pay rent or quit. In the area of Citra and now SB 91, um, tenants are entitled to 15 days notice to try to come up uh, and make their declaration and come current um, and abide by the new rules. Uh, 15 days also excludes weekend and court holidays. So if you're trying to do a 15 day notice had you done one over the December holidays, it ends up being more like a 20, 25 day notice with all of the holidays. So you gotta be sure that you don't try to cut off a tenant's right to cure too soon. Uh, when I talk about these forms, I had been doing this in front of an organization that had access to the uh, California Apartment Association. And I would recommend that if you're investors that have property managers, they may have access to these forms, or if you're doing it yourself, you really should become members of the California Apartment Association because they have all the forms that are up to date. And CA 400 was the informational notice about Citra. Uh, I already described what happens between September 1st and January 31st under Citra, and what happens for non-payment of rent from March 1st to January 31st. Um, the, it becomes a consumer debt, which means, again, in the past, you could go in uh, under Citra or SB 91, somebody doesn't pay rent, you go to trial, and you try to collect the rent um, that is due, up to 100% of the rent is due, now, if they qualify, but then stumble and don't pay later on, you can only collect um, the 25% in court. The other 75%, you'd have to go to small claims court, and we'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. This was the old 15-day notice uh, under the uh, SB 91. Uh, this, uh, and here it is. Thank you for inserting this. This was good. This was done after I did my PowerPoint. Uh, this is the new 15 day notice to pay rent. Uh, and if you look at the rent period now from September 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, the, what SB 91 did is it extended all of the deadlines that would have ended January 31st all the way to Fe June 30th, 2021. So here you can have an agreement with your tenant, your rent due amount paid balance due, you can have a payment schedule, but keep in mind, that if somebody uh, wants to pay 25% of the rent, they would have up until June 30th to do it. So let's say they qualify for uh, COVID and they have $2,000 a month rent. Well, September 1st to June 30th is 10 months rent. That's 22 times 10 is 20,000. They could pay you $5,000 of rent on June 30th and they're timely. So let's, this form is very detail oriented. I don't know if afterwards, we, I'm happy to share this with anybody that wants this PowerPoint and you can look at it more closely, but let's go through the form very briefly here. Next slide. This is the 15 day notice. This is the notice from the, uh, the uh, state of California. This explains to the tenant what the landlord has served on the tenant who's not paid their rent on a timely basis, what their rights are as a tenant under SB 91 which was similar to what their rights were uh, under uh, Citra. And then there's an instructions for the, for the tenant to fill out, instructions for declaration. Let's look at the declaration on the next page. This is what a tenant under penalty of perjury has to say, you know, that they have to, under penalty of perjury, they've had a loss of income caused by COVID-19 or increased out-of-pocket expenses directly related to performing essential work. Uh, and there's all of these criteria, any of these six qualify uh, for somebody to invoke their rights under Citra, no, SB 91, meaning that they're not required to pay more than 25% of their rent up through June 30th, uh, 2021. Next slide, please. AB 1482, 
not only is this complicated enough, we have Citra and SBR, uh, SB91, but what is true of Citra is true of SB91. AB 1482 was enacted in, uh, to, uh, became effective on January 1st, 2020. And one of the last seminars I did before the pandemic was for Korea on AB 1482. Little did we know that we'd have all these new laws regarding moratoriums and pandemics. But AB 1482 creates a statewide rule for just cause evictions and for rent caps in areas where there are no local jurisdictions that already have just cause and rent control and for properties uh, that are at least 15 years old or older from the date of certificate of occupancy. So if you've got property that was built 16 years ago, it's subject to AB 1482. There are ways that under AB 1482, if you're a mom and pop and own a second home and you're renting it out and you're not a corporation, um, you can exempt yourself if you give notice in a certain time frame and, and, and you say, I'm not subject to AB 1482. However, what Citra did was say, hey, look, we're gonna, during this pandemic, we're gonna expand uh, AB 1482 to cover virtually every property. There are some exceptions, I'm not gonna talk about them, today, but one of the things again is that um, under SB 91, if you have a fixed term lease um, uh, under AB 1482, uh, the end of the expiration of the lease does not end the lease. You have to, set, you have to provide the, the tenant with an extension of the lease under the same or similar terms. So if you have a one-year lease, you have to give them another one-year lease and only if they refuse to sign a new lease and don't want to extend, then you can have them vacate voluntarily or you can have them uh, evicted. But now uh, there's no fixed term lease at the option of the tenant. They can stay as long as they uh, don't violate other terms of lease and as long as they pay rent. There's another important uh, change in the law that applies to AB 1482. One of the ways that you could evict a tenant is if you wanted to do a, a remodel and that you had to pull building permits and do some significant remodeling and you wanted to upgrade your property. Well, no longer under the pandemic can you use that as an excuse unless the substantial remodel is due to some public uh, health and safety violation. If there's some you know, hazardous waste or there's some asbestos or something that's really urgent that the city is telling you or the county is telling you to change, uh, then you might come within that limited exception. But right now that's really not viable for most people. Um, these were under Citra. I'm going to pass this because these dates no longer uh, are, are relevant to us as we go forward. Next slide, please. Again, Alameda County, the only law in the county, even under SB 91 and Citra, uh, the residential applies uh, countywide. It was in effect. There's only an exception if you're going to try to remove your property from the rental market, but you got to be careful if you're in Berkeley, and I'm not going to really talk about Berkeley or San Francisco because of all of the special rules, but if you have Ellis Act obligations, you have to go through that notice period. Fremont does not have any Ellis Act restrictions, so if you're gonna to try to sell your property, you can use that as a basis for removing. However, in Alameda County, um, the local rules are even more strict than the county ordinance, so you'd have to basically show a public health and safety violation in order to evict somebody. Um, next slide. Now we're down to SB 91, and on January 29th, you know, the legislature and the governor are like, a lot like our kids uh, when they are doing homework. They may be given an assignment to do for two months, and they'll do it all the weekend before it's due, right? Well, the state legislature is a lot like that, and so they had this February 1st or January 31st deadline or Citra coming up. And on January 29th, the, uh, almost at the 11th hour, 11th hour, they enacted SB 91. And it continues the, the right of landlords to collect only 25% of rent through June, of, June 30th um, and extends the moratorium even further. So that means that you cannot go into court to try to, to, to evict. And there are new tenant protections, which I'll talk about, that were not in Citra that you need to know about and new state rental assistance. Uh, which I will touch upon here, but touch upon again in the other slides, uh, creates a new 80-20 rule for landlords for tenants who qualify for assistance. In very simple terms, if you qualify or your tenant can qualify for rental assistance, uh, you, if you waive 
20% of your rent, they can qualify it, uh, at 80% of the rent that's due and you cannot ever collect the other 20%, but at least you're getting a stream of income from the stimulus money that's theoretically gonna be available to all of the landlords out there that haven't been paid. There was a mandatory notice, and again, I'm gonna be making a um, uh, somewhat of an editorial comment. I think this is really unfair to landlords. The legislature comes up with new rules, and I mentioned it was a mandatory notice that had to go out by September 30th under Citra to, to advise all tenants that are not paying rent that there's new rules under Citra. Well, there was a mandatory notice, so had we had this talk last week, I could have said, hey, run around and make sure you send this out to all your tenants by February 28th, so you're timely. Well, it's after February 28th, the, the notice form is out there, it's uh, uh, California Apartment Association has the form where you have to notify tenants that have missed rent since March of, of 2020 up to the present at any time of the new law. Arguably, if you failed to do that, then you give them the 15 day notice and you haven't given them this notice and you didn't do it by February 28th, some judge somewhere may say, well, you didn't give the notice before February 28th, you can never kick your, your tenant as long as this moratorium's in place. Pretty harsh. My recommendation would be get the forms. If you got a tenant that hasn't done it, go ahead and send it out now and, and, and try to show substantial compliance. Get them on a program where they're paying 25%. Get them on a program where you may be getting state rental assistance if they qualify. And if you're working with the tenant collaboratively, uh, cooperatively or collaboratively, and then the tenant flakes out, you're in a little bit of a better position. Next slide. Um, again, um, the uh, rent due from March 1st to 2020 through June 30th, I'm sorry, March 1st through June 30th, 2021 is now subject to these restrictions. I gave you earlier, I showed you the form for the 15 day notice required for non-payment with the tenant declaration. If the tenant does not give you the declaration within the 15 day period, and again, 15 days have to count holidays, um, weekends, um, you have to add those, you, you can't count that towards the 15 days, you know, 28 days pass, you, you try to reach out to the tenant, they blow you off, then they can't be subject to these protections. They haven't given you the declaration in a timely way. However, however, and I may have this on a future slide, but I'll cover it here. You, you said, okay, um, I'm going to go back into court uh, when I can, which is after June of 2021, I'm going to go back in court for a 15, you know, I'm going to go into evict the tenant. The tenant has five days to answer an unlawful detainer complaint. Well, one of the things they can do right away is say, you know, I'm sorry, I should have given the declaration. Yeah, I got served with that. I kind of blew it off. I wasn't paying attention. But now I've got a tenant's attorney that's told me how important this is. I have, here's my declaration, judge. And the COVID declaration could be shown after you file the lawsuit, serve them, hired an attorney to do all of these things. And uh, then you have a hearing before you even proceed with the eviction process. And the judge could excuse the tenant and say, yeah, you should have, you should have filed this uh, 15 days after you got served. I'm gonna give you a break. Here's your COVID. You get to go back to your place. You don't have to leave as long as you pay 25% of your rent. And the landlords basically has to start all over again. So again, very tenant friendly. Um, and there's opportunities for tenants to have, in golf, you call it mulligans, do-overs, you know, opportunities to cure. Whereas the landlord has these, as I mentioned earlier, these hard deadlines of notices that have come and gone that could be considered gotchas and prevent the landlords from being able to assert their rights to recover possession. Again, the 25% rent payment that Coco mentioned under Citra, under SB 91 is extended through June 30th to a qualifying tenant that submitted the declaration. And again, AP 1482, uh, just cause ex expansion under CTRA or Citra is now extended under SB 91. Next slide. There is now two different kinds of um, rent collection, okay? There's two kinds of debt. Uh, there's rental debt for failure to pay uh, any rent at all or by failure to declare hardship in a timely manner. And it's really and, which is if it's a debt that is accrued by a tenant that is not giving you a declaration, then that rent is subject to the old traditional laws of an eviction process. 
or the 75% of the rent that's deferred if you're only collecting 25% of the month. 75% of the rent that you don't collect from the tenant is not part of any kind of notice to evict ever to recover possession. You'd have to have an independent small claims court action. Well, small claims is limited by uh, claims against a personal, uh, uh, you know, if you're a personal uh, defend, uh, plaintiff, your limit is $10,000 against a defendant and $5,000 against an individual. Uh, but uh, under these new rules, they've blown off the cap. So if you've got $50,000 of rent owed from your tenant, you can go to small claims court, okay? Um, and, it's, and you can, uh, I'll talk about some of the issues there. But the exception, if the unlawful detainer was filed before October 1st, 2020, and tenant would not have qualified for rental assistance at that time, you can stay in unlawful detainer uh, regular court. But that's such a, that's a, you know, if you haven't gotten any UDs filed, that exception is already, uh, already passed for you. Next slide. This is something you're also gonna to have to show uh, when you file a lawsuit. Landlord must show good faith effort at investigating rent relief for the tenant, that you sought governmental or third party assistance for the resident, that you cooperated with the tenant in seeking rent relief. Uh, and it applies both to the non-payment of the 75% in small claims or the non-payment for failure or refusal to qualify for COVID-19 hardship financial distress. So uh, before you're gonna have an extra piece of paper, you're gonna have to show the court that the, the SB 91 makes you basically a partner with your own tenant to try to collect rent. There can be a win-win in that, but it really is a situation where you're gonna have to have the tenant co uh, cooperate. You would expect a tenant to cooperate to try to get you rental assistance, but you're gonna have to show these steps, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, let's go to the next slide, I'll explain how that works. Um, there's, again, sorry, live, somebody's calling. Um, I'm in my office here. There's two classes of tenants going forward, the ones that have the hardship declaration and all residential tenants. If you have a tenant that's giving you that declaration I showed you earlier, under SB 91, you cannot collect late fees. Uh, for non-payment. You can't say, okay, they were gone, let's back, back in June of 2021, if they haven't paid, you'll add up all the late fees for those months, you can never collect them. And if you had late fees before that weren't collected or paid for by the tenant for March of 2020, you can't collect them. You can also not increase or charge new fees for service. So for example, if you charge a tenant $20 per month for parking, you cannot increase that parking uh, privilege to $50 or $75. Um, this is a way, frankly, for those that have hardship declarations that, that are COVID affected, that they cannot, um, that a landlord is not, doesn't have an incentive to try to collect rent through other means, through fees and through uh, new charges. Whether a tenant qualifies for a hardship declaration or not, all tenants, even if the tenants are paying fully and are not subject to COVID, you cannot apply the security deposit uh, to any rent that's missed without tenant permission. Second one, rent payment must be applied to future rent. So let's just say you've got a tenant that didn't pay in February, pays in March, pays in April, doesn't pay in May. You got to apply that rent to that particular month. You can't use the, the rent that you collect in March to go back to February and say, oh, you still owe me for March. That was an open question under Citra. My guess when I was asked that question in seminars that I gave last year uh, in September and October or November on Citra, I happened to be right. You gotta be, you cannot use the rent to go back in time. The idea is to, to limit the future losses of a tenant so that it's harder to give a three day notice or a 15 day notice to pay rent or, or, or quit. Also, when you're applying, when you're getting new tenants coming in, if they've had COVID-19 problems out of prior uh, tenancy, you cannot screen them out as a negative factor. 
Um, in addition, uh, you cannot assign rental debt to collection agency until July 1st, 2021. And you can never assign out collection to um, tenants for which who've qualified for rental assistance. Again, it's going to, uh, um, it's consistent with the notion that 20% of the rent that you're gonna waive if you get ready a rental assistance, you shouldn't send it out to a credit collection agency and try to collect it uh, sideways indirectly with the credit collection agency paying you for you know, pennies on the dollar for them to have that rent to collect. Next slide, please. SB 91, this is the big, you know, at the end of the rainbow, this is the golden um, pot that everybody wants. The new stimulus money from federal government, who qualifies? A household income earning 80% or less of area median income. And one person in the household either qualifies for unemployment benefits or financial hardship or increased costs due to COVID-19. One person in a household risk of homelessness or housing instability, and they have past due utility or rent or eviction notice, unsafe living conditions. And who receives the funds? Well, the first round's gonna go to those that are less than 50% of AMI, okay? And so all of those that have applied uh, get the rental assistance. Um, the second area is communities that are disproportionately COVID impacted. So I'm thinking that, you know, you might have areas down in LA, which has had fire, ha, far higher rates of COVID transmission than in the Bay Area. There may be areas where you've had tenants that are at 60 or 70% of AMI, but they'll be in queue, they'll be in line second up because the whole area has been COVID impacted. And then finally, the remaining group of uh, renters that will be entitled to rental assistance will be up to 80% of AMI as the last round. When, do you, when can you start applying? And you as the landlord can start applying with the tenant cooperation, uh, cooperation March 15th through the State Housing and Community Development. We, we jumped by it earlier, but in the um, uh, East Bay Rental Housing Association form, um, there was on the, the second to last page, a reference to uh, housingiskey.com. Um, and maybe we can put that in the chat, housingiskey.com. And there's a 1833 number that we can call to find out how to apply and to start getting the applications in for your tenants to start paying 80%. One of the downfalls of this is if you had a past tenant that moved out who might have qualified, but they've already left, you can't get rental assistance from that tenant to pay the back rent that's owed. You're stuck at that point with trying to go to small claims if they, are, they were qualified for COVID uh, to try to collect that rent. You can't get it from this stimulus money. Next page, please. Um, again, landlord and tenant can apply for funds. Remember I said that if you go to an unlawful detainer complaint, you're gonna have to fill out a form saying in good faith, you try to do whatever to try to get rental assistance. They will open March 15th, up to 80% of rent due from 4-1-2020. Through, and I think this is a typo, it's through June 30th, uh, 2021. Why is it 401 2020? I had, um, uh, that was when the, uh, the uh, Citra went into effect going back in time. Um, but again, waive 20% of the past rent. What if the landlord refuses to apply? Let's say, I don't want to be bothered with all of these forms. You tenant, you can get whatever rent you can get, rental assistance, but leave me alone. Well, you can do that if you want to be stubborn as a landlord, but the tenant can apply, but is limited to, the landlord can only collect 25% of the rent. And uh, uh, can you refuse to, to even take whatever rental assistance they come up with? Likely not under the fair housing laws, it would be discrimination, discriminated against your tenants on the source of income. So if they have rental assistance from the stimulus money, take it. Um, you're gonna be, this is basically, the, you have options as a landlord, but the choices are really not good 
that they're really pushing landlords into the 80 or 20. If a tenant can say that, hey, look, I tried to apply for more rent, but the landlord was insisting 100% and all I got was 25%, small claims judge is gonna look at you in a couple of months and say, well, well, you can't get, you, you've lost the other 75% too. So there really isn't any economic incentive for a landlord not to want to apply for rental assistance because they're basically, uh, you're basically undercutting your ability to collect uh, close to, you know, up to 80% of your rent. Um, as I mentioned before, the state funds that are going through the stimulus package aren't available to landlords to reduce rent due from a former tenant. Let me talk about small claims because I've done small claims as well. I've been a small claims judge. I think we're looking at a nightmare scenario. Uh, small claims are generally attorneys that volunteer their time, they're not judges, and um, crazy stuff can happen. If the landlord goes in and for whatever reason, the small claims judge is pro-tenant uh, and you lose, you can't appeal, you're stuck. And even if you think that the law was improperly applied, if, if you win, or even if you win, let's say you had a $50,000 claim and your tenant is complaining about, you know, retaliatory eviction or other defenses or whatever, it says, judge, it's not fair, it's not fair, and the judge reduces it to $35,000, the tenant has a right to appeal. So if you're a tenant that is a difficult tenant that hasn't paid, that you couldn't work it out through mediation or through informal means, that tenant likely is gonna to try to string you out. And so they're likely gonna appeal. And so now suddenly you're gonna have small claims appeals that are heard before judges and they don't have the resources uh, right now to do it. So this sounds like a remedy, uh, but it, it is something that you need to be prepared for and discount mightily in terms of whether you're going to be able to be successful through that process. And all you get at the end of the day is a paper judgment and the tenant may be long gone or maybe still there, maybe they're caught up, but then you have to go through uh, 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 credit collection efforts and there's all these limitations on what you can collect through co as a consumer debt, um, but you're, you're basically uh, gonna be spending a lot of time trying to collect that past rent. I hate to be so pessimistic, but I wanna give you a real world view of what I think is gonna happen. The legislature doesn't practice law. They don't have to worry about going into small claims. It sounds good on paper, but you need to be prepared for, for, for the realities and the limitations of small claims for the uh, non-COVID uh, rental debt. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide before we get into questions. So I'm hopefully, I'm, uh, hopefully I'm, you, you'll have questions for me uh, because there's a lot of information here. It's, it's really hard to absorb. I actually was watching a, a presentation the other day by another attorney and she didn't even have any slides, sadly. And it was just, it was hard for me to follow. So I appreciate how uh, dense this information is. Um, the takeaway really is that you really should um, hire an attorney and, or your property manager should uh, hire an attorney to uh, do this right because there's so many uh, traps for the unwary. But there are future developments that may have some positive impacts for you as a landlord. Again, March 15th, uh, start uh, getting familiar with that, uh, that website, see if there's any sneak reviews on the uh, rental applications for rental assistance. Uh, uh, Fremont, for example, has already been given 7.1 million uh, again, I don't know what the rules are as a block grant, if they're gonna minister it under their own rules or some cities that are getting block grants to look directly. If you live in a community, if you have a property in a community that was less than $200,000, those communities got block grants that may have their own rules uh, for applying the rental assistance. Uh, the C There's also something else that is kind of, um, puts a kibosh on everything that we're talking about. Let's say you've done everything right and you're one of these very, uh, you, you're a landlord on your toes and you tell, say, Ms. Bonacorsi, I gave my February 28th notice uh, and today is March uh, 2nd. Uh, on March 1st, I already gave my 15 day notice and it's not a, a, a CARES back, federally backed mortgage. They're supposed to be out on uh, in, in 15 days if they don't give me their uh, COVID uh, declaration. 
So at the end of the March, I want to go into court if they don't pay. I don't think they're going to pay. Can I go into court, court at the end of March? Well, no, not under not under um, um, SB 91, which won't happen until June. But even if you could theoretically go in sooner, theoretically you can go in sooner uh, under the CDC moratorium, which is nationwide, the Center for Disease Control, uh, they extended uh, the uh, ban that had ended on December 31st to the end of March with certain exceptions. So that moratorium would prevent everybody from going into court until at least April. But there may be some, you know, again, silver lining here, the American Recovery Program. Um, and it really is, uh, the reason I mentioned March 15th is not because it's tied to the March 15th date for the um, uh, for the, the assistance to the state funds, but I've been hearing that the Senate needs to pass it by March 15th to go to the president's desk uh, because uh, of the uh, unemployment benefits running out. So I think we, we should know in a couple of weeks whether this recovery $1.9 trillion American recovery program is passed in which there's going to be new monies for uh, for rental assistance. I haven't, please don't ask me any questions about the ARP because I didn't study it on the thought that whatever happens in the House may not necessarily happen in the Senate. And until there's a final package that is actually signed, who knows what last minute compromises there will be. I didn't want to opine as to what, what that program would be. And there's a outside chance that uh, the Democrats don't get 50 senators to sign off on it because no Republican is going to sign off on it. So if they don't get 50 senators plus Kamala Harris as the vice president uh, to uh, to break the tie, uh, there's no ARP at all. So I don't want to talk about something that may never happen. Um, but one of the things that I've heard that I should you should as a forewarning, I'm not being a pred predictive, but likely is the moratorium on evictions could be extended all the way to September 30th. So even as potentially you could get back into court at the end of June for uh, SB 91, for people that qualified beginning on July 1st, you go back to a three-day notice to pay rent or quit, you'll still have to be mindful as to whether or not there's a nationwide moratorium that prevents you from getting into court. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I had about 5% of this this presentation on commercial moratoriums. Let's look to see if Governor Newsom extends commercial moratoriums beyond March 30, 31st, uh, 2021 to allow uh, moratoriums that are, that, are, that are in existence in San Mateo County and in Santa Clara County. And uh, Santa Clara County applies countywide uh, uh, unless a city has its own version of a commercial moratorium. San Mateo County only applies in the unincorporated areas of San Mateo County uh, for commercial moratoriums, and I think the city has one there too. That may that authority may to to be able to enact, renew, amend the commercial moratoriums will be um, lost as of March 31st unless the governor extends it. So this concludes uh, this concludes my presentation except for any questions you may have. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Coco and to the team, okay? Thank you so much, Dave. So before we start the Q&A, I would like to give a quick reminder. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel and connect with me on WeChat. It's the best way to stay up to date on my latest active listings and videos. It's how you will know when my upcoming seminar will be and what it will be about. Simply scan this QR code for YouTube, this one for WeChat, and this one for WhatsApp. If you've already done all that, I really appreciate it. Now, let's go to the Q&A. We have collected a lot of questions from the audience on our different platforms. It's not too late to see <laughs> the questions. <laughs> I know, huh? Yeah, so just type it into the chat to our co-host, and I, we will make sure it gets answered. So, uh, Dave, the form you mentioned earlier about uh, apartment association, you say it's good to get all the form from apartment association. Uh, car form also has those similar forms. Are they serving the same purpose? Yes, they are. I, I should have mentioned, I forgot that among your group are realtors. So yes, the California Association of Realtors 
has come out with forms that are similar and they're very good. Okay, so for yeah. the yeah, so for the tenant for the tenant relief act that has to be serviced before February twenty eighth. Uh, so now it's already passed February twenty eighth. What can they do if it's already passed? I my 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 assumption is if they're not paying, well, I would just send them out. I or you can send them out in connection if they're if they're not paying rent for March, and they haven't paid you rent for February. When you do the fifteen day notice, if you want to save a little money, you can give them the notice at the same time. Um, if for some reason they paid in March and they're up to date, yeah, uh, then that's even better. You just give them the notice at that time, no harm, no foul, because they're paying 100%. And if they want to go down to 25% uh, later on, then they know they have that right. So I would just get it out there and go to the mercy of the courts and say, look, you know, I, 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 I didn't have the benefit of a retinue of attorneys. Uh, when the legislature passed this, I'm trying to be a good faith landlord. And if you have that in conjunction with trying to get rental assistance for your tenant and doing all the other things that are right and coming up to speed on it, um, I'm hoping that judges won't make that a gotcha. But you can guarantee, I can guarantee you that tenants and tenants attorneys will try to make it a gotcha. Okay. So uh, for the so for the 25%, whatever tenants paying for whatever they are not paying, or maybe they're not paying at all. So the government trying to subsidize at 80%. How do you get the 80% um, after this whole thing is done? Do you have to file something else in the end? Well, that's the thing that as of March 15th, I'll have a clearer idea of what it looks like. But on the housing and community development site, um, a website through the state, there should be some opportunities for filing an application and what the process looks like. Right now, as I'm speaking, I am typing in housingiskey.com. That's the website. And I just gave you the phone number of 1-833-422-4255. I've not called or looked at the website yet, but you might want to start looking at that and getting up to speed. You might also look, if you're like in big cities like San Jose or as I mentioned, Fremont, there may be some local uh, rental assistance programs you're going to have to familiarize yourself with them as well, and they may have different rules, but the funding may be available earlier. Okay, so basically, by filing for that uh, mortgage, uh, not mortgage, tenant relief notice before February twenty eighth, does not guarantee you're going to get the eighty percent subsidy from the government. You have to file another application. Right, you have to, yeah, and no sooner, at least from the statewide grant, it's not available even for application until March 15th. And as I mentioned, and again, this, this is good for these questions because it allows me to go over some of the things that I went through very quickly. Remember that from the state fund, there's really three pots. The first pot is, well, they'll be funding anybody that's 50% or less of AMI. The second pot will be those that are in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And then the remaining dollars will be those that are between 50 and 80% AMI uh, that qualify for rental assistance. So there'll be, it, it's not, you're not gonna be able to, it, 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 you know, it, it'd be ideal that you put in the application March 15th and then suddenly on March 16th, wired and miraculously in your account is 80% of all the past rent that's been due since last year. It's not gonna work that way. Okay, so if the AMI is actually over the 80%, you can't get any subsidy from the government. That's right. <laughs> at least from the statewide program, right. If there may be some other programs or nonprofit organizations that are helping out, again, you can try to show an effort. There's probably nothing out there, um, but you have to show the effort working with your tenant to try to get, get whole. But I guess the, the, the flip side of that is if they don't qualify, then you're not put in the position going 80-20. Um, and if they're still COVID impacted, but they're above 80% of AMI, and as I mentioned, even potentially 130% of AMI, if they give you documentation that they don't qualify for rental assistance, you at least try to capture the 25% as um, rental debt. Uh, uh, and then the, the other 75% would be subject to small claims. Okay, so the rental debt will be subsidi subsidized by the government if it's COVID related reasons. No, no, let me try it again. Let's say you have a tenant that is less than 80% AMI and the rent is $1,000 per month. That means, and it just happens to be 80-20, but 
you could get up to eight hundred dollars in rental assistance, but you waive the other two hundred dollars for the thousand dollar a month rent. That's one category. Let's say you have a tenant that is COVID impacted, but doesn't qualify because their income is over eighty percent AMI. Okay, they can't. They don't qualify for any rental assistance, but they've given you the COVID declaration. That means for any one month, you could collect two hundred fifty dollars and no more from them. Uh, and the other $750 per month would be part of the small claims action. It's not subsidized by the government. You got to go chasing after it. And you don't even have the right to collect the $250 per month as long as they pay you 25% of all the rent that's due by the end of June 30th. Okay, so the MI is talking about the tenant's income, not the landlord's income. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Right. Uh, make, yeah. Maybe. Uh, maybe so, after all this, I don't mean to make light of the financial stress, but I know landlords may feel like they're they're, they're going down below eighty percent of AMI with tenants not paying and not being able to do the upkeep of their property. But the AMI focuses on the tenant's uh, financial situation. Okay. What if they're not paying at all? So the twenty percent is tenants. It's tenants response. So twenty five percent is supposed to be the tenant's responsibility. What if not paying at all? Two scenarios. One, you give them a COVID, that notice that we went through earlier, and they give you timely a COVID declaration, or not even timely. Uh, you have to wait and see. Again, I gave the example earlier that somebody from September of 2020 all the way through June 30th could be having to pay $2,000 a month of rent, and they could pay 25% of their rent, or $5,000, or 25% of $20,000 on June 30th, and they're okay. Um, if they don't return the COVID declaration and don't pay you any rent, then yes, you can go into court and start trying to uh, evict, okay? Okay. Okay, so um, Jackie asks, if tenant did not owe money up to now, but now is sick with COVID and missed the payment in March, what should we do? We did not fill out the form SB91 because the tenant did not owe rent before. Excellent that's question. A, that's a similar question earlier. What do you think? No, no, it's a good, it's a real world question though, because this is a perfect example of what I would suggest you do. Um, is you definitely need to give them the 15 day notice to pay rent or quit. Even if you know that they have it, you should have them get fill out that declaration. And just for good measure, since they there was no penalty in that situation for not giving the uh, SB 91 notice by February 28th, because they have been paying every month. You only had to give it out to tenants that hadn't paid missed a monthly payment beforehand so you know if it's unnecessary to give out the notice and it's too late do it anyways if you're already going to serve them with the notice for the 15 day give them the the sb 91 informational notice just as additional notice the information in the sb 91 informational notice that was due by february 28th is included in the 15 day notice that goes out but it's you've got it you can say look judge i just did it as a courtesy I didn't do it before February 28th because they had paid all their rent, but here it is. Okay. Sounds good. So um, Nima was asking for 75% of the remaining rent, what would the small claims court do if the tenant still say that he or she does not have the money to pay? And how much would be for small claims court fee for 75% remaining fee? How would, how would you pay that for the landlord? Okay. There are no fees tied to the amount of debt that's concerned. I know the filing fees are really nominal for small claims. I don't know what they are, but they don't change based on the amount of debt that's owed. Uh, and the, the inability to pay should not be an excuse for non-payment, okay? It's now a debt. Whether you can pay it or not uh, is immaterial. You owe it when you can pay it. Now, the small claims judge should just award you the 75%. However, the small claims judge has kind of an equitable discretion and may have a soft heart and arbitrarily say, well, I'll cut it in half because I feel sorry for you. You as the landlord really can't do a dang thing about it because of small claims and it's very informal. But you, if you're the small claims landlord going into small claims, you can say, look here, and I would, again, um, uh, if you know if they're below 80% AMI, um, make sure before you get to that point 
that you've done everything to try to qualify for rental assistance so you're not banking on the 75 percent in small claims if for some reason they didn't pay you and they're still 80 above 80 percent ami uh and they didn't qualify then you can tell the judge this is another reason why they should pay the 75 percent they made choices and they didn't choose to honor their contract with me and so dollar for dollar they owe it to me okay an email is asking what will be the process to evict the tenants where should i start for the eviction process again this this whole thing is like a flow chart that i've gone through with this powerpoint with sb91 and citra are you a tenant that um, um submitted a 15-day uh, declaration, uh, a, a declaration after within 15 days of a notice. If you have, uh, the landlord has to wait until June 30th to begin the eviction process. If they haven't, then you got to check whether the moratorium still applies and prevents you from going into court. Uh, you got to have to see whether the moratorium gets extended to September 30th. If the moratorium doesn't get extended, then you can uh, you can theoretically go in in April if they haven't given you any declaration back. Except if you're in Alameda County, in which case, basically tenants get to say they're rent free for the foreseeable future. Got it. Uh, so there's a question about land contract. I'm not sure I understand this. Maybe you understand this. How does the COVID-19 eviction laws affect eviction as a result of a default of a land contract? Of a what contract? Land contract. Doesn't affect it at all. Um, if it's like a, a, a straight up purchase and sale land contract, um um i have let me let me let, i'd have to know more let me tell you that that this is where car can come into to assistance if somebody is buying a house uh from a builder or from a seller so there is a form due to pan, due to the pandemic that can extend uh either the closing or allow the the buyer to recoup their deposit when ordinarily they would be in default and lose the deposit to the seller. So there's a car form, I don't have it in front of me, but you'd follow that car form that you would encourage buyer and seller to, to address that situation. But if it's an ordinary unimproved parcel of land um, uh, and the buyer um, doesn't come up with the money, then the, the buyer is in default and the seller uh, uh, if, if damages goes under the liquidated damages under the contract or um, has to come up with a claim for damages. Okay. So um, there's another question. If the tenant pays some of the rent, for example, total rent owed is 10,000 and tenant pays like 4,000, can the landlord get assistance of, on the 80% of unpaid part, which is the unpaid part is 6,000 times 80% was 4,800. So they're confused since less than 80% of 10,000. So which 80% which we're talking about? Well, I think what the rental assistance presupposes or requires is first of all, they gotta be a current tenant, not a past tenant. So if the tenant is $6,000 short on rent owed, then they are arguably gonna be um, down for, uh, you know, so you get 80% of the amount that's owed. Not 80% of the, the 10,000, but 80% of the amount that's owed. You don't want to be refunding tenants that have paid because it's a limited program and you only want to give money out, uh, not only want to give, but the rules are such that the state funding is limited to unpaid rent, not paid rent. Okay. Zhiming is asking, as a tenant, can landlord charge me early termination fee, like half a month's rent, after I give the landlord 30 day notice before moving out? And apart from this, the landlord did not agree on my move out date and asked me for additional 10 day rent. Can I get those money back from small claims court as a tenant? Yeah, it's a little bit outside this presentation because that's not true. That, that they can't do that, I don't think, under ordinary circumstances. Ordinarily, the landlord is limited. Uh, well, if you if the landlord is limited to, let's say, um, you gave 30 days notice, but your rent for the entire month is due for that month, whether you stay the entire month or not. So at most, the landlord could collect the entire month's rent, even if you gave notice to be leaving halfway through that month. 
okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but no 10 day, there shouldn't be a penalty or some surcharge above that amount. And yes, you should go to small claims and try to recoup that. Okay. There's a question, does it matter how many homes the landlord own or is if the home is owned by a corporation or LLC? Okay, well, this is an AB 1482 question. Theoretically, you could have a mom and pop own 100 homes and they could still be exempt from AB 1482 by giving out the exemption notice and serving it on the tenant and ideally having the tenant sign off as an addendum to the lease. On the other hand, a corporation could own one home as a corporation and be subject to AB 1482. In the legislator, legislators in, in enacting AB 1482 uh, looked at the realities that most mom and pops at best own one additional home as a rental, maybe two, but what you're not gonna have a mom and pop truly be mom and pop owning a hundred houses. They're probably gonna wanna have be a corporation, okay? So, um, and spread their losses a little bit. So if you're a mom and pop and, and, and the name is in your own name or in the name of the trust, or you could even be an LLC as mom and pop, husband and wife as the only members of the LLC and there's no corporation in the LLC, or you can have an LLC where it's mom, pop, brother, and best friend, and none of the, our members are corporate members of the LLC, you can all be exempt from AB 1482, except that exemption is not applying under Citra and SB 91 uh, until SB 91 expires. Okay. I'm quickly looking through a lot of questions. How about for tenant lived in the townhouse less than 12 months that was not subject to AB 40, 1482 just cause. Is it still subject to AB 3088 just cause? Those are a lot of terminologies that. <laughs> okay, well, 3088 is Citra. So um, the answer to that is likely, if you have a month to month lease, you could theoretically give a 30 day notice uh, less than 12 months on the 11th month uh, uh, to vacate with no reason, okay? So it may be exempt from just cause. Um, uh, but um, again, if you gave a 30 days notice in February, uh, before the end of March, you can't begin evicting until April. Okay. Um, how because can I apply CDC, for- Because of the CDC moratorium, so I apologize. Okay. There's a, there's an audience, uh, how can I apply for new renters assistant in San Joaquin County, like Stockton? Uh, again, you may have some communities that are less than 200,000 there. So you should check with your local city. If you're in a, like Tracy or, uh, although Tracy is a pretty big city, but there's some small rural communities out there. Check with your local officials to see if there's any local money available. But again, on March 15th, uh, try to get the statewide eligibility. Okay. okay. Uh, the other thing that you got to keep in mind is area median income changes with the area. So somebody earning 80% of AMI in Santa Clara County may be earning $100,000 a year and qualify you know, if they're single, uh, but they might have to earn only $60,000 a year or $50,000 to be less than 80% in the Central Valley. Okay. Okay, does the current eviction moratorium also apply to non-living units such as garage and storage units? If a garage tenant does not pay, can we terminate the garage lease? I'm not 100% sure of the answer. My default, because I don't, I, I'm thinking of a traditional, re, there's a definition of a residential unit and my belief is that it applies even to garage leases, okay? I actually what, think. What, that, do you have an answer to that, Coco? I actually uh, think if it's not a living space, it probably will be very hard to quote unquote evict somebody. And I, I, I would rather think the landlord may even get into trouble by right, leasing out right. to a non living space. Yeah. You have other problems. Yeah. I know that, it, for example, hotels and lodging at a hotel is exempt, or, you know, university dormitories are exempt. There's, or affordable housing units have their own rules or 
uh, Section Eight has their own rules. But if you're if you're using up space in your house for somebody to live there, whether they have a right to live there or not, Foco is absolutely right. You're probably going to step on other issues there. Yeah, I do think yeah, be careful, especially nowadays. Tenants are very smart, so try to make sure everything you your whatever you're renting out is actually legal space. Yeah. So are the laws apply the same for someone renting a room in the house? Yes. Okay. Yeah. AB 1482 theoretically does not kick in until you're renting three or more units out of your house. But for purposes of, um, <laughs> if you're treating somebody as an individual tenant, again, you gotta go through the process of a three day notice or a 15 day notice. I would err on the side of applying that. There's no self-help. You gotta go to court at some point. So you better err on the side of trying to provide all of the protections that somebody's getting. Let me say, I didn't make this big policy argument because we're now a year into this. And I've said this early on when I started giving presentations back in April of last year. And maybe we're forgetting about this. Okay. Landlords are getting squeezed and I'm very, very sympathetic. Tenants have disproportionate rights during a pandemic, which gives them a lot of leverage. But the idea behind all of these laws is to produce to reduce uh, transmissibility of a of a very serious virus. And the way to do that is you're trying to have laws that keep people in place. So if you're looking at the public policy behind what we're doing, where you've got tenants that may not be paying rent, certainly not paying 100% rent, the laws have been created to minimize people running around trying to look for new housing, moving up and down the state, moving wherever, and spreading um, COVID-19. So when you ask about, well, I got this tenant here, I got that tenant here, can I kick him out and put him on the street? Everything right now is geared towards keeping them in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, how long will the rental assistance last? Good question. I don't know until it's used up, okay? And again, I would have another look, see after mid-March or the end of March and see if the American Recovery Program gets passed and if it augments that or adds it or creates new programs. And I'm gonna put out a hypothetical that nobody's asked me yet because I don't know, I, I'm gonna put out a hypothetical where I don't know the answer to this question myself, but just to think about, just to be prepared for it, that you have a tenant that qualifies for 80% AMI and would otherwise be eligible and say, okay, wait in line, you're in the third uh, pot after we deal with 50% AMI and those that have uh, disproportionate impact from coronavirus, and they get to your third uh, wave and they've run out of money. Or they don't have 80% of your rent and you get 50% of your rent. So you've made this 80-20 split. What happens to the rent that you don't get to collect in rent relief? You certainly have to waive the other 20%. Do you get to collect the other 30% you didn't get out of the 80% or, or, or let's say you get zero. Are you able to collect the 80% against that tenant? Arguably, yes, but right now it's the, the and I haven't looked at the fine print on SB 91 to deal with that question yet. I wanna see how this program on, uh, on uh, you know, if it's a successful program and everybody's happy and fully funded, that's fine. So this is not a, a March 15th question. This is probably an April 15th question or May 15th question. But what is, how does the law deal with not getting uh, on, uh, all of the 80% from rental assistance that the tenant should otherwise be eligible for because there's not enough money? What are the landlord's rights? What are the tenant's rights under the circumstance? That's an open question that I don't know the answer to, but we should be thinking about. Okay, and, and somebody asking, can you please explain what is AMI again? Oh, area median income. In every area like in, Alameda County, Contra Costa County, Santa Clara County, they have area median income. And this is really important for determining um, various eligibilities for, for programs. So in, in Santa Clara County, let's say the median income is $120,000 per, per year. 80% of that is uh, $96,000 per year. Whereas let's say in San Joaquin County, the average uh, median or the median income 
is 90,000 a year, that means 80% is 72,000. So the, 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 there's a Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I'm not sure whether it's by county or by region, it may be by the Bay Area, um, but I believe it's by county. You go to the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, uh, which is the US Department of Labor, and look up AMI. And I'm sure with, um, um, with CAR, and with the California Apartment Association, they'll supply you that information to know uh, these levels, okay? Okay. Because that's also relevant if you're under AB 1482 about how much you can increase rent per year. And I don't have the numbers memorized, but that is somewhat dependent upon um, uh, CPI at least, so. Okay. Um, how, um, let's see, how backed up with the course? when the courts open back up for evictions. <laughs> it's going to be a nightmare. And what's going to happen is I know that for small claims, which is not the question you asked, but it's relevant for the for people that are going to try to collect the 75% of the rent that they couldn't collect from a COVID eligible tenant. Um, that already in Santa Clara County, we've got a mediator. A mediator will meet with people. I suspect that they may create mediation services or a lot of off ramps for people to try to settle cases in the hallway because they simply don't have enough time for court. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention because this is not about, uh, uh, it's generally not relevant to the attorney client relationship, at least it isn't with me and most attorneys, we collect our fees from the client. But historically, uh, you could collect your reasonable attorney's fees that are under a lease as part of a judgment. So once you finally get to court, if you're in court for two or three day, days with the attendants have a right to a jury trial, you know, so if an attorney charges $500 an hour and it's eight hour trial, that's $4,000 a day. And you're, you're, you're down 12 to $15,000 for one tenant trying to collect rent. Well, you could add to your judgment, um, the attorney's fees in addition to the rent that's due, okay? Well, one of the things that SB 91 has done is it limits that. It's it's capped at $1,000. The judge has some discretion if there's something complex about the case, uh, but the judge could say, no, it's not complex. You only had to deal with the issue of possession and whether they paid and you did it. It's nothing complex at all. So you can only add $1,000 to the judgment. So even if you collected all of the rent someday from a credit collection agency or from a tenant uh, that wants to pay off the judgment because they're trying to finance for their first home or whatever happens, they need to clear that off the record. There's never going to be a reimbursement for the attorney's fees that you incurred. So that's going to be a real disincentive for you on the back end. Um, it doesn't change the equation uh, where most attorneys 99% of attorneys are not going to depend upon the tenant to pay your, your fees going into court. But what this will do is you may go into court, you may say, well, gee, they didn't pay rent. I've got a rental claim for $50,000. And you end up taking 10, you end up taking 15 and moving on. And if they're out, they're out. Uh, and then you can start renting and starting over from scratch from some tenant that's got a job that's going to be able to pay in a post pandemic and, and write this off as a, as a loss. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, uh, frustrating stories, uh, but, the, uh, but the quicker that you can get through the process, that's fine, but the backup is gonna be like everybody else. They're gonna want my day in court or the tenant may insist on their day in court, they may insist on a jury trial. And if they can't afford a jury, the jury will still be provided to them. Um, you know, so there's a, and then after you get a judgment, they may try to file for bankruptcy and you have to go to the bankruptcy court. These were true even before the pandemic. And if a ten, tenant wants to string you out, they're going to be have more, more ways to string you out longer than ever before. That kind of answers the next question, which is how much is the cost to evict the tenant? So the answer is unknown. <laughs> unknown and, but what is known as under SB 91, you, you're limited to $1,000 for a contested case. And even if it's a default case and you're lucky the tenant doesn't answer in time you could, and you still had to pay a couple of thousand dollars for an attorney, it's only $500 that you can add to the judgment. Okay. So another question, if the renter does not want to sign any paper for whatever reason, 
what can we do? What paper are you talking about? I think maybe the notice, like the notice of the uh, relief. Oh, 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 for rental assistance? Yes. I don't know why a tenant wouldn't do it. Um, I don't know either. I, um, I, that question's not clear, but yeah. whatever paper, so nothing you can do then, right? You just have to show proof that you serviced it. Uh, well, I think that's where you show emails, you create a paper record of saying, look, uh, this is a way to get rental assistance. Here's the link. Here's here. Yeah, there is paperwork where you're going to have to have a tenant sign off. And for whatever reason, they don't want to sign off because they don't want to have the landlord maybe find out about their financial situation, whatever it is, you can show all the steps that you took. And then at the end of the day, you, you, you're able to fill out that declaration that you need in your unlawful detainer complaint that you did the steps and for whatever reason, your tenant refused to get rental assistance. And it allows you to proceed on the unlawful detainer complaint. And assuming they, they were smart enough to give you the COVID relief, you can get 25% of the rent that's due in that judgment. And then still in a separate proceeding, collect the other 75% in small claims. Okay, great. We have a last question and from Rose. This is not really about COVID, but if you could uh, just talk briefly about a law that went, to, went into effect in 2020, Wondering if it's okay to do a notice of change of something of terms and tendency to cover um, Silver Code 1946.2 that went into effect on July 1st of 2020 to cover a lease that we have in place now. Can you just briefly talk about this new law and can we add addendum to a new lease? Does Tri County. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll answer the question that I think it is where I know the answer. Okay. She threw around a lot of statutes. I haven't memorize the civil code section, but I think she's talking about AB 1482. And there was a July 1st deadline by which if you had an existing tenant, you were to have given them uh, as part of the lease notice of um, your the, either the applicability of AB 1482 or that you were in, yeah, there's a little checkbox you can get from the California Association of Realtors or CAA uh, saying here's the statutory language in bold print where I'm exempt from AB 1482 because I'm not a corporation, okay? And if you give that to them um, before July 1st of 2020, that's all you had to do is give them notice. After July 1st, they're supposed to sign it, sign it as an addendum to the lease. So if they've refused, but it's a one-year lease that's over, uh, when you're renewing the lease, at least initially, you can have them try to sign that as an addendum. And um, and then if they refuse to do that, that's a separate issue. But there are other ways to do it. Uh, arg arguably, ideally, you want them to, to sign the addendum exempting yourself. Okay, so the apartment association as well as uh, car should have this type of addendum they can add to the current lease going that's forward, right. right? That's right. Okay. So uh, people asking for a copy of the PowerPoint. So you can email me and I will share the PowerPoint with you. So make sure you email me at coco10group at gmail.com. Uh, Cam, you can go ahead and drop our email into the Zoom chat and then I will make sure you get a copy of the presentation slides from Mr. David Bonacrossi. That looks like all the questions. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, now we are all well informed about SB 91 and the other rental laws. This is the end of the seminar. So we have, we're going to unmute everyone so that you can say thank you to David. <laughs> <laughs> if it's still quiet, I'll be really worried. <laughs> <laughs> or stay and network with me or with each other. We can stay around a little bit. We're going to stay around a little bit longer to, if you have a question that's unique for you, David may be staying around a little bit longer. Sure. I said I will see you all next time and uh, have a great night. <laughs> Thank you, Coco. Thank you so much. Yeah, so email me if you want to get David's presentation slide. Um, really appreciate very much your time, Dave. Um, I know you're busy and then this is, uh, you're not charging me hourly fee or charging the audience. No, next I'm not, but my email is there too on the PowerPoint so then they can follow up and- Yes, it, it, reason. Be, make sure you, it's on there, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Thank David. David. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, David. Very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you very much.